So hi, I'm, I'm Barbara Keating and I'm a visual artist and a beekeeper and I also do media training. Um, you can see my uh, social media links uh, on the page in front of you if you want to look up a bit more about what I'm doing. And um, I've been doing, uh, since about 1992, I started creating video arts, installations, events, um, all that kind of stuff. And all that work for years and years happened indoors. And at some point I began to realise that summer and winter I was just in dark spaces. And, and my body was crying out for vitamin D. <laughs> so I dreamed about keeping honeybees for a long time to get me outside, get me away from computers. Um, and then I got all romantic about it, remembering all the old beekeepers from where we holidayed as kids in North Yorkshire. And some of the old beekeepers would give you the half filled um, wooden sections just as a treat for the kids fresh from the hive. So bees always meant that kind of thing to me. Um, and also, you know, we had the kind of childhood where you went out in the morning with your sarnies and you didn't come back until, you know, it was tea time and you did all sorts of dangerous things, which nobody would let children do now. <laughs> um, but also there was a lot of time kind of hanging about in hay meadows and helping with hay timing and kind of dipping in ponds and puddling in streams and, you know, lighting bonfires at night by the river. So that was all kind of in my mind that I wanted some of that back. Um, but of course, once I started keeping honeybees, then a whole different set of understandings uh, came. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, that. And I, um, I should have been playing this, let you listen. Just a few seconds of that. So this is footage that I've been working on for my latest art project. And um, this was in the middle of winter two years ago with honeybees in a winter cluster. So just keep that buzz and hum in your mind. So let's go on to the next slide. So what I wanted to start thinking about was why have honeybees become the poster child for biodiversity? And thinking back to my own kind of dreamy visions before I started. Um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about statistics about decline in bees, what that'll mean to our ecosystem, our survival as humans, and keeping honeybees seems to a lot of people like a handy way of being able to help with that. You know, you can do something and you can do it in your garden or your allotment and it's, you know, doesn't take up too much space, all that kind of thing. You know, it should fit nicely into your lifestyle. Um, and the other thing is that the hive stays in place, you know, once you once you put it somewhere so you can always go back and look at it. We can take off the lid and we can look inside, see everything that's going on and lovely smells and uh, sounds of the bees. They're really fascinating to look at and great for scientific study. Um, and we also get to wear kind of, you know, some kind of uniform that's slightly mysterious with a veil and we've got smokers. Bit of a ritual, isn't it? You know, puffing the smoke like incense in church or something. There's all that ritual stuff about it. And, and then uh, there's a certain cachet about it. Uh, but humans have got a long relationship with honeybees and it's dating back to, you know, the days of uh, prehistoric paintings in caves where, you know, honey hunters have, were climbing up vines and taking honey from the bees. So in our mind, you know, we've had a relationship with bees for millions of years, really and they're uh, embedded in our culture and our language. They're just kind of part of, of, of what we are in the background all the time. And there's a lot of our language um, that we're aware of, but maybe some things we're not so aware of. So um, I just want to ask you, Sharon, and I know you're muted, so you're not going to say anything now, um, but without Googling, just have a think about a collective noun for a group of bees. Everybody watching be Googling, I guess, as they go along. Um, but I'll talk about it at the end a little bit. So we know that pollinators are in decline and honeybees do pollination. This is another thing about why bees might be the poster child. Um, and there are benefits from hive produce. So, you know, we've got um, honey, which we like to eat. It's also hygroscopic and antibacterial, so it's good for wounds. We've got propolis from the hive and then, you know, James Fernley will be talking a lot more about all of that in a lot more detail. Um, and especially during lockdown, I think people have had a bit of a pause, a bit of a time to read nature books and videos, 
and you know and, and people have become more aware of what's going on and so that's kind of encouraging people you know i'm getting a lot of requests at the moment can you put bees on our rooftop for businesses and i'm always going no nah, not no no um, but i'll talk about where bee honeybees choose to live and because it's trees and bees um about the relationship with that and um, yeah, one of these wise old sayings was bees in a wood never do any good. That was one of the first phrases I heard when I went to bee club. Let's have a look at that. So I've got a little video, um, which is by Morris Baker. So honeybees are going to nest naturally in a tree cavity by preference, because um, that's where they used to live a lot of the time. And in other sorts of cavities, rock faces and things, but a tree is a natural place for a bee. And according to Laurent Larrier so of the French Institute for Agriculture, tree cavities are absolutely essential for biodiversity, including um, honeybees. He says that globally, trees can be thought of as micro habitats in themselves, like a complete living environment, almost like a galaxy. Um, so a tree root cavity, um, for instance, can become an ephemeral oasis is what he calls it. And it develops very evolved habitats over time. But if that one tree is harvested, then that micro habitat is completely lost. And some species that are linked with special hab specialized habitats like that, um, they become marooned and isolated um, as their needs aren't met on different trees or younger trees. So just thinking about older trees here. And cavities are formed uh, with naturally occurring injuries to trees. Uh, so woodpecker damage, for instance, wind damage. This causes rot. The fungi will eat rotten dead wood. And it's then the cavities are then further enlarged by different insects and birds which inhabit them until they become large enough as a potential site for a honeybee colony. So that can take decades for that to happen. So older, log, larger trees are really important for their microhabitats, but also for these slightly larger habitats for things like honeybees or bats or whatever, which can actually move themselves further to a new location. Some of the smaller creatures can't do that. Um, and things like coniferous trees take an awful long time to, to develop their biodiversity. And then, um, just thinking about um, that's in, in sort of you know, um, deciduous woodlands and non-commercial forests, that's how it would be. But um, forestry workers in certain commercial forests in France um, are now starting to mark, trace and keep certain trees safe um, within commercial forests. Because normally um, any decaying wood or wood with faults would cause problems in timber processing and also end use of timber. So they really don't want decaying wood. So now in certain places, they're actually starting to cultivate that in order to maintain biodiversity. Um, and sometimes they're trying to actually, uh, in some places they're, they're experimenting with actually injuring trees deliberately. So these cavities form, but they're finding that the, that that's, doesn't develop very quickly and is not necessarily ideal. So that woodpecker's doing well. On to the next. <laughs> oh, I missed that bird song. <laughs> so what you know, what is a desres for honeybees? You know, I've got location, location, location spelled habitat, habitat, habitat. <laughs> so honeybees uh, are the only kinds of bees which are um, the ones to live as an active colony over winter. Um, and that's actually why they store honey and pollen. It's not really for us to eat. <laughs> we all knew that, didn't we? Um, European honeybees ideally prefer a cavity of about 40 litres volume, but between 10, 20 and 100 litres, depending on the size of the swarm looking for a home. And I had a whole, ser a whole series of slides about swarms, but we don't have time for that today. That's time for another talk specifically on that. They also seem to prefer higher sites than those close to the ground, um, because they're away from non-flying predators like bears and badgers and all that kind of thing. So they like to be about three meters up. Ideally, they'd like to be sheltered and south facing, not exposed to weather or too much full sun, 
um, but enough sun so that in winter it's warm enough for them to get out for their cleansing flights because they don't like to poo in the hive. Um, they also like somewhere where they can create quite a small entrance um, and the entrance that's shown uh, on the slide here uh, is relatively large but in the winter they might actually cover that over with propolis and wax mixture to leave a small hole that they can defend quite easily. And um, I, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I might show the video of that at the end, I've got time to do that. Um, but there are, and as to, um, they, they need to collect food, which is pollen, nectar. They also need water. They need water for diluting the honey uh, when they need to feed it to baby bees. And they also need propolis, which is tree resin. And in, the, in their natural settings, uh, they have certain kinds of population density that they would settle at, you know, that's ideal for them. So there are slight de de variations found by researchers. Um, so the slight differences between population densities recorded by Tom Seeley in the USA and Laurent Laria and the other French researchers in the Ardèche. Um, but these bees tend to like to have two or three colonies per square kilometer. That's, that's what they like. Um, managed bees, colony densities in the UK. So um, just thinking about my own bee colonies and where I've got them. Uh, within a radius of the village that I'm in, there are 118 bee colonies, managed bee colonies. These are ones that are registered on Bee Base, which is run by the National Bee Unit. Not all beekeepers are registered on there by any means. <laughs> um, and in, uh, so this is within, a, you know, 10 kilometres, which is the average foraging radius. And um, Newcastle City Centre, where I've got my bee project bees, my bees banquet bees, there's another 118 there. And I've got some bees over on the disused airfield at Albemarle Barracks. And there are 74 colonies within that 10 mile, uh, 10 kilometre radius. In London in 2015, there were 13.5 colonies per square kilometre. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a hell of a lot compared with what bees actually like. Um, so this puts an immense pressure on the habitat and uh, in the wild, um, they did a lot of research in France about when the, you know, and in the UK as well, there's been a lot of research done about how the Varroa mites um, started infesting the colonies in the 90s and, you know, all our native bees died out and feral colonies survived and now we're building up those stocks again. But, you know, there is a, there is kind of a difficulty in managing bees when they're in overcrowded situations. So it's just something to think about. And there are lots of beekeepers um, like myself on the project in Newcastle and especially in London. Lots of beekeepers are starting to provide more forage in terms of, of trees and flowers, but also to create habitats for all the other pollinators, which is really important because otherwise honeybees are overloading the environment a bit, to, you know, and it's potentially to the detriment of other bees. So this picture is um, traditional beekeeping in Russia, in the Ural Mountains. And there's not much of it going on at the moment because again, um, bee populations um, you know, new, new populations of hybridized bees uh, were moved by beekeepers, moving colonies uh, for pollination of crops um, and also the movable hives. So people started bringing more and more colonies to the forests. But traditionally, um, these Russian princes, um, my notes are telling me from the 1100s to the 1600s, these princes owned um, bee forests in the Ural Mountains and the largest trees were protected as bee homes. So they actually cut into the trunk of the tree and made a cavity, but they maintained them. And some, it's a family tradition. So only certain families were permitted to do this um, and to keep bees. And some of these bee trees had remained in the same family for about 300 years. It's just incredible. So it was done very carefully and very sustainably. And I think we have to start thinking kind of about that before, how much pressure we're putting on the environment, how much 
like farming it is where we're trying to extract perhaps more than the landscape can give us until we regenerate the landscape so um yeah that these russian bees are uh, the, the populations are under threat from hybridization of bees brought in from different areas bees which may not survive as well in that climate and um, and then the research is in France and there's a, a beekeeper called a very experienced beekeeper whose um, family been keeping bees since the 1970s and he's in the Ardèche in France um, and his question is is beekeeping necessarily burdensome for the species you know what models of relationship with the species can we hope to achieve in order to respect its nature you know, is unlimited beekeeping still sustainable um, and also why are there many obstacles to the conservation of the um, we've got the black bee, which is sort of near native bee um, to, to our area, as opposed to bees which might come from um, you know, Slovenia or Italy or, you know, further east into Georgia or wherever. Um, and there's groups of us now, there's bee breeders um, in the UK. Uh, we're getting together, I think it's about 3000 now signed up to try and nurture these locally adapted bees and, instead of importing bees, which may import disease, may import pests, particularly something like a small hive beetle, which is um, prevalent in Italy, and we're trying to stop it coming here. So we're not saying, you know, totally don't import bees, but to point out the danger of that, and also to, you know, to restore our own, um, you know, kind of more locally adapted bees. Um, I won't go at this, that could be another talk really more about what, what happened in France and, and the, the lessons that they've learned. But the takeaway from what they've done um, in terms of, of looking at what happened with Varroa, with disease, with hybridization, um, they've actually started now trying to bring protection of the black bees into law. And, uh, you know, that would be contentious and probably very contentious here. Um, but they're trying to establish conservation areas. And given that France is quite a much bigger country and they have much bigger areas of forest. Uh, but they want some conservation areas with sedentary colonies. So beekeepers are not transporting bees and potential diseases and pests around the place so much. Um, that would be difficult for some bee farmers, certainly in the UK, because they need to transport their colonies to various crops of pollination. Um, but, you know, maybe we could think about areas where that might not happen. Um, but they're also going to, uh, so as, in addition to having these sedentary colonies, they're not going to feed them. Uh, they're going to allow them to swarm naturally so they can choose um, the densities of population themselves. Um, they won't be clipping their queen's wings to keep them in one place. Um, and they'll allow natural selection and no varroa treatment within that specific area. And um, that way they're hoping to limit over exploitation. So they won't be taking, you know, they, if, if they have a big honey crop, they won't necessarily take a big honey crop from them. Because the idea is to have them for pollination and not for honey production and for, for their genetic um, benefits rather than honey production. So we've got to start thinking about bees in a different way, really. <laughs> um, we've also got um, thinking of bees and trees. Um, you know, the top slide is probably more what we think of when we think of an orchard. And I'm lucky enough to have two trees in my village orchard, which is it's pretty much like the top one a lot of the time. Not as many bluebells. <laughs> um, but... Um, just I've got books here as well I just I, I, I've been reading this wonderful book which you've probably read and um, about orchards in England by a specific orchard which everybody should read so it's this book it's a poetic series of observations uh, and it's on a, a hidden ancient messy but commercial orchard uh, and it's really, really rich in biodiversity. Um, and, and the book is just a joy to read. But the authors are asking questions and putting forward a vision which could possibly be applied to different forms of cultivation. But um, in the bottom picture, we have a contrast, um, which is, this is um, one of the almond orchards in California. And um, I think people have probably become a bit more aware of it lately, that these are actually huge, huge industrial scale 
concerns. Um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's just industrial farming with very little biodiversity under the trees. Um, there's only a single crop there for bees to eat. So it's just like having, um, they, they have to feed the bees um, sugar syrup and pollen patties, like um, artificial foods, in order to have enough bees um, of the right age for foraging when they take them there. And this uh, was thought to be contributory to the big collapses of bees that happened in America over the past years and gave people this idea that all bees needed saving or all honeybees needed saving. Um, and just to, to put it in, in kind of perspective, so 1.5 million honeybee colonies, that's like boxes of bees are trucked around the US and half of all US colonies go to the almond groves. They're given sugar and syrup and pollen patties, it's like pop and crisps in a way, to create large brood numbers earlier in the year so that the bees are big and have older uh, bee colonies are big and the older bees uh, foraging age uh, mature when they get there. And there's 800,000 acres of almonds, let alone all the other fruits. And these bees get trucked around, you know, they might finish the almonds and go to another crop. Um, and of course, the, you know, for efficiency, the bees are planted, the trees are planted at a certain distance so that the machinery can, can get up and down the rows and there's this little competition. So, uh, you know, I just put a note to myself and I do say to friends who are vegan and who are buying almond milk, have a think about that. <laughs> think about, you know, you know, do we do do we need to be doing it in this way? But change is afoot, and there's now an association for the uh, a lot of the almond growers in California, and they're now beginning to see the benefits of providing better bee habitats and more flowers under the trees for biodiversity. And certain places they're finding also that other kinds of pollinators, like bumblebees or solitary bees, and sometimes flies, there are other pollinators which are beneficial too. So, you know, that the, they're beginning to change the way they work now. And, uh, you know, we need to think about how we, how we can manage food better for pr food production. You know, we, we just need to um, think about how we can do that rather than just having bottom line production for food, um, you know, which is happen for various reasons <laughs> um, but the cry always comes up that we need industrialized farming to provide cheap food for poor people who can't afford these you know posh foods produced locally and organically etc and my reply uh, is often spoken with a bit of hint of passion every time is um, why are people not being paid enough to eat food which doesn't poison them or harm the environment you know, so there, there are there are more changes to make than you know, just our own backyard, we need to think globally on that. Um, and we did subsidise farming um, post-war for Dig for Victory. And this led, you know, as everybody knows, probably, or a lot of people listening to this will probably know that, um, you know, um, almost all our clover and flower rich meadows, 90%, 97% were destroyed along with hedgerows and field margins. And then the common agricultural policy also um, encouraged farming of a certain kind, which is more industrial scale. And of course, now we're finding that this is very hard to sustain. So I think if we supported farmers to do that, we need, really need to be supporting farmers to make changes in other directions. And there are farmers willing to do this and wanting to find ways of doing it. Um, but it, but it's obviously it took a while for this to happen. It's going to take a while to change it back. Um, or not change it back, but to, to take it forward. So just apart from honeybees, who else have we got around in our ecosystem? Because as a beekeeper, I'm always aware who else is around. <laughs> so um, solitary bees, we've got 250 species in Britain and Ireland. There's more than that worldwide. And that's um, a, a single bee builds and fills her own nest with food and brood. You know, that hatches the next season. season. Then we've got social bees. Um, honeybees have one queen, she's the only one who legs, lays eggs in a colony and it can build to around 60,000 bees in the summer and that lives over winter on its honey stores and its pollen. 24 species of bumblebee in the UK and we have one queen and a few hundred workers, it varies from bee to bee because there's 
so many. And the nests die over winter and, um, you know, new bees, um, uh, new queens will hibernate. Some of them hibernate for nine months, you know. Yeah, that's quite a long rest, isn't it? It's quite nice. <laughs> So how can we, you know, how, how can we help these? Because if we keep lots of honeybees, we're competing with resources. So we need to plant more resources so we can have the honeybees as well as these other bees. And these bees roughly divide, these solitary bees less divide into aerial nesting solitary bees and ground nesting solitary bees. So in your garden, um, so in the ground, you might see uh, little telltale volcanoes of earth in the soil or in gravel or between paving slabs and that'll be a little little tube a little burrow going down with little tunnels off the side and these queens will lay their eggs in those and then they'll some bees um, will pause their um, pupation halfway through and emerge in the spring and some sort of pupate completely and then hibernate until spring all depends on what they are and then we've got um, aerial solitary nesting bees. So these ones will live in tubes and some of them will, will you know, um, fill these up with uh, their eggs and then they'll close them off with mud. And some of them, the leaf cutter bees, uh, those ones will actually, um, you know, close them off with leaves. Too, too many to tell you about in a short talk. <laughs> um, but if you think about where they live naturally, they like to live in hollow stems and tubes. And um, I was looking out last weekend at my messy garden and shaking my head thinking, oh, my neighbors are all out cutting everything down and tidying everything away. And, and I was thinking, yeah, hmm. <laughs> goodness knows what's hibernating in there. So there might be all sorts of other insects that I don't even know the names of. So I tend to leave my garden a bit messy. You know, until everything started again, because the solitary bees um, are just starting to emerge now. Bumblebees are coming. And I've got a little video here, which is a bit wobbly. It was done with a 360 camera. It was quite a steep slope. So I was halfway up it and my dog was at the end of the lead, pulling to go and see somebody. <laughs> but these are actually chocolate mining bees. I don't know if the video is big enough for you to see them. Yeah. And they're, they're quite funny because this one, it, Sometimes they go into the wrong house. <laughs> so these are all nests. And I saw um, a picture the other day that um, Charlotte Rankin from, from the Natural History Society uh, and um, the Northeast Bee Hunt, she'd been up at the Spetchels uh, up in Prudder near where, not of uh, the Tyne Valley. And it's one of the, the largest solitary bee nesting sites. It's absolutely huge. So what can we do to help them? Well, again, uh, we've got bumblebees that can uh, that are living in holes in trees. They'll also live in holes in the ground. They'll dig a burrow. They'll use moss and straw and all those things as part of a nest site. And you can build or buy bug hotels, but there are some caveats to this. Um, Bees will generally use these um, things like, um, you know, the, the bug hotels that you buy from the garden centre, but um, a lot of them might have been made in the Far East where the insects are bigger and sometimes the tubes and the holes are slightly the wrong size. So maybe, you know, they won't get filled. Um, and although holes drilled in wooden blocks are great, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Um, we've got a big, massive fancy bug hotel on the top right there. Um, so you can drill holes in wood uh, and they're great and the bees will use them, but you can't clean them out easily. So if there is any bee disease, it might stay there. So just be careful to make sure that you're able to clean them out each season, but you can fill them with all sorts of things. Um, you know, uh, just don't use plastic tubes. Um, and think as well about spacing because it, it might look great to go for a, you know great you see these huge fancy bug hotels as you know, like whole garden size almost um but then it can turn into a bit of a canteen for predators <laughs> if they're all together so maybe think about spacing them out around your garden uh, but ideally leave hollow stems and piles of leaves and twigs 
uh, be a bit messy. Yeah. And if you aren't sure and you want an easy way to get into it, um, I've just been sent this um, uh, bug hotel, it'll be hotel by Mason Bees. And they send you this kit, which has the, you can see the cardboard tubes as an inner tube in. And once a bee has filled that, and those are all, across the top, you'll see all the different kinds of bees that will nest in those tubes. And you can actually send the cocoons off to be hibernated with them over winter so that predators don't get them. Or you can take, remove them from the tube and put another, um, another little insert in so another bee might have potential to nest there. Um, and you can keep them in your garage or somewhere safe. And that way you'll be able to increase the number of bees if the predators are not getting them. So that's quite a good way of making sure we've got you know, to take care of these feral unmanaged bees. And then at the bottom right, this is a slide for, for making a very, very simple bumblebee nest. Um, you know, you just have a, a slate or a tray or something at the top and a hole, a uh, bit of a hose pipe. There's different ways of making them. Um, so you can get involved in lots of ways. Uh, in the Northeast, we're doing the uh, Northeast Bee Hunt organised by the Natural History Society of Northumbria again and we've been very lucky this winter because they've put on courses and um, Charlotte Rankin and Gordon Port have been doing uh, garden bumblebees and uh, garden solitary bees just absolutely brilliant introduction so wherever you are there's probably something like that going on in your area but um, I'm going to give Sharon a whole list of resources on bees um, because there's just so much help out there, so much help and recognition and what you can do for them. A bit about the artwork and other projects that I'm involved in. Um, this image is from the original Honeybees Paladar, and uh, that was part of the Eat Festival. So I've made several artworks about our relationship to bees and their needs, with a focus on the links between human and honeybee diet. And a couple of these have drawn quite large crowds at GNM Hancock and one of those was as part of Dippy on Tour which was a fantastic day and they've been done in collaboration with a huge variety of food growers, bee researchers, palynologists, beekeepers, naturalists, all sorts of people and also of course Climate Action North. But my artwork focuses on engaging people in better understanding of how and why to plant more and better variety of foods for all bees and pollinators, to leave some things alone, grow without chemicals, uh, for those ephemeral oases that uh, we mentioned before that Laurel Laria talked about. So a few years ago Simon Preston persuaded me to take part in this EAT festival. And I created an immersive dining installation where the menu is based on bees, what bees like to eat, rather than honey, we associate with the mere mention of honeybees. Diners were ceremonially invited into uh, the bees world through image, sound, smell and taste. And although there was a honey tasting, as you can see from this frame of honey kindly donated by Carl Miller, um, the uh, main focus on what what it was on what bees eat and of course how it has a lot in common with what people eat. There were scents of beeswax, propolis, honey and food and the hum of the bees just put everyone at ease. When the diner sat down as you can see on the on the picture at the table they were covered in images of bees and could see them on the tablecloth and the bees were bringing in pollen, feeding each other, passing messages about the colony state to one another, processing honey and pollen. And as the evening wore on, um, people got, began to look and notice more detail and conversation flowed naturally around the bees' um, activities and their needs. And rather gratifyingly, I've heard uh, all these years later from a couple of different sources what a wonderful experience it was and how the bees' needs remained in people's memories. So, um, these pollens uh, were taken from a hive I was using to study when uh, conducting proof of concept for my food and bees project. Uh, the pollens were um, enhanced and made into motion graphics using Apple Motion. 
and the images were uh, you know, uh, collected by Matt Pound and Rinka Vinknu. So I'm involved in two major projects at the moment to encourage bee-friendly urban habitats and comparing these with rural sites, both providing research materials and engaging the public and businesses in practical activities. So Bees Banquet in Newcastle and Gateshead, working with Dingy Butterflies um, and in Gateshead Best of Benjamin Collaborative. And I'd resisted keeping honeybees in town many, many times when invited to do so by businesses because if I felt it might just be bee washing, people just getting their green credentials by keeping honeybees. And uh, as you probably gathered from the rest of the talk, I don't think it's necessarily the answer to that. But I felt it might justify because I was invited by Kaz um, Thomas, Karen Thomas, the landscape architect who does the Grey Street Gathering. And he explained his aims about bringing nature back into cities and reconnecting urban populations with nature. And we wanted to use a bee colony to monitor the effectiveness of this. And this also came through Matt Pound and Rink of Inknook, who are studying um, urban and rural diets of honeybees. And I have an established honeybee colony on the terrace at the old co-op. Uh, which will be filmed uh, from underneath the hive for a 24 hour cycle once a month for a period of one year from May 2021. And this and another colony in a rural location will provide samples, pollen samples for identification. And so this, this um, full project has been made possible by the incredibly generous loan of this professional infrared camera from FLIR Systems for a whole year's filming and also sponsorship of In Kind from James McAleer and Mike Pentney, who are uh, Phantom Line Pictures, and also they run a Notorious DIT. And the people who let me keep the bees on the rooftop are Cushman, Wakefield, who own the site. Many other people have helped. So infrared footage combined with aerial footage of the landscapes at all four seasons, plus pollen, bee bread and honey collection, with ID by the guys from Northumbria University will build a picture of what forage is available and how the bees behave all year round in an urban setting as they forage. Um, Matt and Rinker's study is, is funded by BBKA and uh, in collaboration with chefs at Blackfriars restaurant we're designing menus based on what the bees are eating in each season plus some of the surprises and food will be served in an immersive installation at Blackfriars restaurant and we hope possibly other places. So the work's really about memory and recall and that's long-standing themes in, in, in my work. And uh, I see the bee colony memory and human memory around food um, as quite interlinked. And I think of a bee nest as a memory of all the seasons that have gone by and it's told by pollen, nectar, propolis and wax and how the colony and the individual bee's behavior adapts to its surroundings over seasons. So if we can continue the study over a few years, we'll be able to see as the city greens and there are lots of plans afoot and in action right now. So we should be able to monitor those changes. And um, in Gateshead, um, I'm working with dingy butterflies and communities in Benjamin Saltwell. And a group of us are working on mapping and surveying local brownfield sites with a view to recording what wildlife has colonized there since houses were knocked down and the need to find alternative spaces when inevitable redevelopment begins and to create pollinator friendly habitats. Uh, we're working with some fun ways of conducting the research uh, in collaboration with fellow artist Dominic Smith. So watch out for updates on that. So this is the test footage from the original Bees Banquet filmed on the Fleur T20. And um, I just wanted to conclude by asking, um, you know, right at the beginning, I was saying, why are, why are honeybees the poster child for biodiversity? And wondering if at the end of the talk, people still think that keeping managed honeybees will actually save the bees. You know, if you want your business or your community group or personally want to save the bees, would you still think first about honeybees? Uh, and I'm hoping I've persuaded you to get more involved in campaigns to promote preservation of ancient trees and habitats because they can take centuries to form 
we need to plant not only wildflower meadows, but varied trees, shrubs and flowers in our communities, on industrial sites and estates and in farmland. Uh, most importantly, we need to nurture these habitats, often by just leaving things alone. <laughs> That's, um, and you can get involved in lots of ways. You can set up a community food or flower gardening group, nurture your local waste ground, do surveys to see what's on it, create ponds for wildlife and for bees to drink from. And you can do it quite cheaply if you do things like do bee friendly plant swaps with your neighbours, for instance. And as I've been doing for the last eight years, do, do fruit tree grafting. You can have patio sized, you know, tub sized trees up to huge gardens, fruit trees and nut trees are great. And you can get involved in lots of ways uh, with bee spotting and wildlife recording. And there's, you can use portals like iRecord and you can get onto Bee Line. There's, there's loads of help. If you're in the Northeast, get involved in the Northeast Bee Hunt. Um, and I just wanted to go on to remember what I, I said about um, at the beginning what was a collective noun for a group of bees and most people you know you put first thought would be swarm because that's all we know um, but these show how embedded in the language uh, bees are so we've got a bike of bees a charm of bees a cluster of bees an erst of bees a game of bees a grist of bees a hive of bees a hum of bees a nest of bees a rabble of bees a swarm of bees a drift of bees and a flight of bees. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to give you a quick talk about the bee hunt as part of the Trees and Bees Conference. I'm Charlotte, a conservation officer at the Natural History Society of Northumbria. And I'm involved with the Northeast Bee Hunt, which is NHSN's citizen science project, really aiming to inspire and encourage the Northeast to look out for and record bees. So in the Northeast, we actually have around 100 bee species. So most of us are aware of honeybees and bumblebees. However, we also have a diverse range of solitary bee as well. And we're home to important populations of rarer bees, such as the bilberry bumblebee and the broken belted bumblebee. The practice of observing and recording bees um, has quite a long standing history in the region. The first bumblebee records actually come from um, the North Books of Albany Hancock back in 1827. However, gaps do remain in our knowledge. And it is important that we continue to record bees to provide a more up-to-date and more complete picture of bee species in the region and to really assess how their distributions are changing over time. And citizen scientists can really help to plug these gaps and really add to our understanding of bees in the northeast. So there are many reasons why you may want to record your sightings. Alongside um, providing habitat for bees and pollinators, you can also really help bees by recording your bee sightings. And that's because it can really help to plug gaps in our knowledge and really add to our understanding of where bees are and how they are doing. In turn, this can inform both regional and national monitoring and conservation efforts by telling researchers and conservationists where species are and really prioritise where action is needed. And it's also a hugely enjoyable activity as well. And in a minute, I will show you how it can be really rewarding and enjoyable to be involved with. Just to provide um, two examples of the impact of your wildlife records. In 2019, the Bumblebees of Northeast England was published and this provided an atlas of both the past and current distributions of northeast bumblebees. And this used over 20,000 records, stretching back to the early 1800s through to the present day. So just really showing how valuable your records um, on a regional scale can be. 
If we look at a national scale, the State of Nature report that was published in 2019 used over 60 million wildlife records. So those records were used to really inform how um, the state of nature is changing under the current um, challenges it faces. And most of wildlife records are really generated by volunteers like ourselves. And it's really important to help inform monitoring and conservation efforts. And getting involved in citizen science can be really enjoyable and rewarding. We sent out a feedback survey to bee hunt participants last year. And some comments really demonstrated um, how valuable and how enjoyable it can be to take part in citizen science. So for some, it was about um, contributing to filling in gaps of knowledge and contributing to local science. Some people really enjoyed feeling part of something positive and really as an opportunity to find out more about bees on their doorsteps and really improve upon their bee identification skills. So it's not only a really valuable um, activity for management and conservation purposes, but it can also be a really valuable um, activity for your well-being and enjoyment as well. So the North East Bee Hunt launched last year in March, and it's all about increasing our knowledge of bee species in the North East and really inspiring the North East to get involved in citizen science and to learn and discover more about bees. Records are encouraged through the iRecord website, which is an online wildlife recording website. And it's really valuable because it makes sure that your records are checked by experts and it also makes sure that your records are made available um, to inform monitoring and conservation efforts. So your sightings are shared with our local record centre, Eric Northeast. They are also shared with national species recording schemes and they are also shared with the National Biodiversity Network Atlas as well, which is the UK's largest collection of biodiversity data. So really making sure that your records are usable and will make a big impact. So to put um, the 2020 bee hunt results in a nutshell, over 2,400 records were generated of bees across the northeast, which is absolutely fantastic. And this was by 170 um, recorders across the northeast. And it really is thanks to those who took part and engaged with the project that the bee hunt was so successful in its first year. Of these 2,400 records, we received over 800 records for the five target bee species that we selected. We received records of 25 different solitary bee records, species, sorry, and 14 um, bumblebee species as well. So really adding to our knowledge of bees present in the region. And this just shows some of the um, bees that were observed throughout the bee hunt. And of course, this was a time when we were staying close to home and local. Um, and it really does demonstrate the diversity of bees that can be discovered on our doorsteps and really the value of taking a closer look and discovering what can be found. And some of the bee species that were recorded do have very few records and very few known sites in the region. And this included the hairy footed flower bee. So this is a bee that's out early in the year and in the region it's mainly confined to the North Northumberland region, so around the Annick area. And for the first time um, last year, this species was recorded further south than known, um, so really adding to our knowledge of this species distribution in the northeast. We also received a record of the lovely Bilberry mining bee. So this is a little solitary bee that um, is associated with bilberry and so can be found in Heathland. And this particular record represented the first record for this species in South Northumberland. So again, adding to our knowledge of this species distribution. 
We also received multiple records of the bilirubin bumblebee, um, which is a less common bumblebee, and the region holds really important populations for this species. And bee hunt records for the species came from both Northumberland and the North Pennines. So good to see that this bumblebee um, was seen out and about during the bee hunt. And the Northeast Bee Hunt is back this year. It launches today on the 19th of March. So it's timed perfectly with the Trees and Bees Conference. This year, we have eight target bee species to look out for, but absolutely um, all sightings of all bee species are very welcome and encouraged. And we also have a range of online events and resources as well to help you discover more and learn more about bees in the region. So these are the target bee species this year. We have four different solitary bees and four different bumblebees to look out for. But if you do spot another bee species, um, please do submit your record because we do encourage um, sightings of all bee species. To help you to look out for and identify um, the bees, we have target bee species profiles on our website and the link to that is below there. So on these species profiles, you can find out how to identify them and more about their ecology and life cycle and plenty of photographs to get you familiar with their appearance. And taking part in the bee hunt is really simple. You just have to find a bee and take a photograph and think about the four different areas of your bee sighting. So firstly, what is the bee species that you observed? when did you spot it, where did you spot it, and also who spotted it. And that's all you need to know to fill in the bee hunt recording form. We have a Northeast Bee Hunt webpage on our website where you can find out everything you need to know to take part, including the link to the recording form and the target bee species profiles, and also lots of resources to help you identify and record bees. And on the right there, you can see the bee hunt recording form on the iRecord website. And this form just requires you to think about and fill in the four different areas of your bee sighting. But if you do have any issues with um, recording or identifying bees, um, please do contact me on my email address and I'll be more than happy to help. We also have a range of online events this year, including the Rare Bees of North East England and also multiple bumblebee identification sessions as well to help you with identifying um, common bumblebees. And we also have a bumblebee event for younger people as well. Um, more information on these events can be found on our website and I'll hope to see you there. So thank you um, for listening. Um, that was a very whistle-stop tour of the North East Bee Hunt, um, but I do hope that it has inspired you to look out for and record bees close to home. If you have any questions or um, would like to get in contact, um, please do contact me on my email address and also check out the North East Bee Hunt webpage as well, because that provides you with um, all the information you need to take part. So thank you very much and happy bee spotting. Hi, my name is John Woods. I'm the Environmental Specialist for 13 Group up here in the northeast of England. We offer a, a wide range of properties, um, including rentable, um, saleable properties and part share. Uh, we're here in the uh, Tees Valley um, and, and areas of uh, Yorkshire and the North East and we offer a, a service for, um, for, for our customers um, of which we have around about 70,000. The team from 13 um, actually work out about 1,600 each having their own type of different work which actually enhances 13 as the company. 13 are much more than just housing, we offer support, care, uh, informative information we employ and we also help with money matters. 
we're currently on site in an area where we've actually, as you can see, planted a number of fruit trees. Um, we, we understand fully from 13 that we need to help the environment. And obviously, as we all know, trees do help with biodiversity. They help with nature. We help with, uh, with, with food source because as these are fruit trees, what the project's about is actually getting local people to actually help themselves to the fruit that will be available. We've got a number of pockets of these across Middlesbrough and we've worked with Middlesbrough Borough Council within this partnership to provide this. We understand fully that trees do make a very big difference to, to carbon, uh, to neutralisation of carbon and, and the effectiveness of creating cleaner, greener air. My role as the environmental specialist for 13 allows me to cover a wide range of aspects, uh, environmentally of course, in that my job is to work with community groups and schools, colleges, colleagues and partners to actually establish a greater environment. We're working on natural environment, habitats and uh, tree and uh, woodland management. We do as much as we can for the environment. We may be a housing company, but we certainly do take our environment very seriously. We have a high regard for not only our customers here on our estates, but also the integration of wildlife. Uh, we firmly believe that we need to support those as much as we do our customers by bringing us all in together. We can all live together. We all have trees, shrubs and plants, and that is the way to actually bring in the environment into our 13 world. 13 may be a small fish in a very large pond, but having 34,000 properties 70,000 customers allows us to open doors into communities, schools and groups that, that we could not possibly reach without that. 13 actually do a lot of work with partnerships, uh, with community groups, uh, with schools and colleges to improve the environment in which we hold. Uh, we get to share this and uh, accommodate wildlife as we do our tenants across the northeast of England. Within 13 we're bringing in um, unused land that would go neglected um, and untidy. What we're doing is actually bringing it back to life, encouraging wildlife, encouraging customers to be part of that um, to improve the environment as much as we could possibly can. As a young lad of about 11 or 12 I was very privileged to have access to a farm of which I spent nearly all my time except for a schooling. On one occasion um, the old farmer uh, Tom Newbold Senior actually handed me a, a stick and asked me to snap that stick as we were sat there having a cup of tea. Um, I snapped the stick quite easily as a young lad, smiled and then said well that's I've done that. He then handed me a dozen sticks and then said again snap the sticks now obviously as a young lad I was very keen to oblige and um, with all the amount of, of twisting, pushing and, and, and movement of the sticks they would not snap. A stick represents one person, many sticks represent many people, your, co your colleagues, your friends, your family and if you stick together and work together as a partnership you'll achieve much more. This will allow us to achieve much more than standalone individuals because as partnerships and networking we can accomplish so much more. One of 13's initiatives is to look at how we can help the planet um, and with this we've come up with a, a concept of 13's Take Control campaign where we actively look at how we as a company can improve our environment not only locally but worldwide. 13 launched its Take Control campaign, which will see the organisation achieve its goals in becoming a much green organisation and in line with the government's target of 100% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. With an important part to play in helping to achieve this target, 13 has set its ambition to reach net zero carbon by 2035 on its direct business emissions. We are investing a great deal of resource as we know this is the right thing to do. When we look at being a housing provider and builder, we need to make strides in undertaking the works and invest in properties. We are working on fuel efficiencies and waste remedies. In Billingham we have the TRC which is the 13 Recycling Centre. This is our waste management centre and puts us right at the front of our green agenda. We also have an ecology centre which allows us to bring in other groups to, to take on a journey and learn about the environment. My role at uh, the TRC um, within the ecology centre 
is, um, is to, to bring in um, outside groups, schools, colleges and colleagues to, to, to teach them um, about the aspects of, of, of nature, of the environment, of positive environmental impacts within the site uh, which was uh, just a, a flat area of tarmac we've actually now introduced many bird boxes swift boxes uh, owl boxes hawk boxes uh, bat boxes as well we also have hedgehog huts and um, on site we also have uh, six hens which we use as part of our ecology center to encourage and to educate people on natural life um, it's also good for, for health and well-being on the site particularly uh, also for, for, for me is the importance of the bees where we put in four colonies um, as there is an importance to, uh, to protect bees and to encourage bees. As a beekeeper for around 12 years experience I've been privileged to be allowed to bring in bees into my workplace part of the TRC uh, we do have a, an, a bee enclosure where we have four very strong colonies. Uh, this again will help educate people on the importance of bees, what they actually do for the world and us as a planet. I think it's vitally important to, um, to educate people, for them to realise that bees aren't them horrible little stingy things at the end of the garden that you'd rather squash or run away from. Bees are actually quite a concept little species, mathematical geniuses and very very active they supply 70 percent of the world's food and as we know for every three mouthfuls of food you take one is on the back of the bees influences not far from the trc we have a lot of arable land a lot of farming going on and this this is great for the bees this is great for the farmers and the, the the local area it allows the bees to go out and feed pollinate and bring back pollen and nectar and then we can actually enjoy the honey too. Here at 13 we've got a lot of projects going on. We involve a lot of our schools and our community groups to help establish this. We've got allotments, we've got uh, tree planting projects, we've got flower planting. Um, a lot of resource is put into this. We feel that engagement with our community is paramount to this. Uh, we're all in this together and by bringing in our communities really does help us with this. The resources we put into this to encourage the allotments that we own um, is, to, is to help provide the knowledge and the background and the sustainability. We need to look at feeding ourselves in our current climate and the climate change that we've, we're faced with. We've got a lot of put, put a lot of effort into sorting out our own values. Once we've grown the vegetables and the fruit from the trees behind and the allotments that we have, this then allows us to share those amongst the communities. The nutrition value is as good as the as, as good as the wildlife environment. It all goes to one goal, and that's an environment sustainability. 13 have a lot of land that we're unlikely to build on. It's what we call back lands where there's no access. So with these plots of land in mind, we offer these out and give them to communities to create allotments. They take on the on the, the role themselves. We offer resources and encouragement we do get involved with the committees to see that everything is covered uh, appropriately. The allotments not only provide us with fruit and vegetables, we also see that some of the areas are left wild. We bring in boxes and trees to increase habitat. So it's a shared environment. It's not only for us, it's for the wildlife too. More recently, we've worked in partnership with Middlesbrough Borough Council in that we've planted 100 trees. This is a great resource as it allows children to reconnect with outdoors. It allows children to understand that apples don't come from the supermarket, they're actually right there on the doorstep. As well as the trees that we've just planted, uh, we also undertake a lot of other tree planting and we see this very, very important within 13. We own a lot of land, a lot of open barren land that cry out for trees and we're privileged to be able to do that as part of our ongoing process of tree planting. The benefit from these tree planting projects is, is paramount. We need to get the children to understand about trees, the nature. Just being outdoors, planting trees, collecting the nutritious fruit helps amongst our communities, our children, to fully understand the benefit of trees, certainly fruit trees in this situation. Trees really help with health and well-being and this is the backbone to the initiatives of tree planting. 
We again at 13 have partnered up with Middlesbrough Council in, a, in an initiative to plant 35,000 square metres of wildflower across the borough. These have been areas of open space for all to enjoy. The, 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 the well-being on the back of this is, is, is massive, but also it gives back to nature. It allows for pollination so that we all can take something from the wildflower that we see throughout Middlesbrough. Can you imagine leaving your home and actually seeing the wildflowers on the estate so much better than just open green space? It allows for nature to get involved, it allows for pollination. It's great for health and well-being. What better way to walk through a park and find wildflowers? We believe that these projects will enable people to take great pride in the, in the areas that they live and also attract more people to our areas. Every little helps and these projects certainly underpin that. It allows us to work with local people, local colleagues, local partners to produce a better greener outlook for everybody. This is only the beginning for 13 environmental projects with lots more to come. All these projects that we undertake at 13 are about giving back, giving back to communities, giving back to the environment, giving back to nature. We are creating greener neighbourhoods and that is fantastic news. Hello everybody and uh... And thank you very much to Sharon and, and all at the Northeast Climate Action Group for putting on this, this really important conference and for inviting me uh, to come back and talk to the conference about a subject that's absorbed me for the last 30 years. Now, for most of that 30 years, I've been focused on researching what the incredible healing properties of bee products, particularly Propolis. But the more I've come to understand the honeybee, the more I've realized that honeybee means much, much more than I could ever have imagined. And it's something of this vision of the honeybee that I want to share with you today in The Honeybee and the Human Heart, Three Dimensional Ecology. Okay. Let's get things in perspective. The honeybee was here first. Uh, honeybees have been around for a hundred million years, at least. Human beings have been here for maybe seven million years. The honeybee is one of the most ancient organisms on the planet. And at a recent uh, Earthwatch debate, the honeybee was declared the most invaluable species on the planet. Uh, it's difficult to, to top that, isn't it? Why? Well, of the 100 crops, 90% of the world's food are produced from, 71 of them are pollinated by bees. This is about 60% plus of, of uh, the world's food supply. But the bee population has been declining rapidly uh, over the last 30, 40, 50 years. You can see uh, from this, this map it's, uh, it's gone down radically since the 1940s to 2014. One of the reasons for this is, is something called colony collapse disorder. The bees which may have, the bees which may be living in apparently very healthy colonies with brood and with food, leave the hive and effectively disappear. Another name for colony collapse disorder is the Marie Celeste syndrome. The bees simply lose their ability to find out, to, to, to find their way back. We don't really know what the cause of this is, and I'm going to be talking about it later on. But this isn't a talk about colony collapse disorder or the, uh, the, the nature of, of, of what's happening to the bees in, in, in their health sense, but it, it's more a question, it's more asking that question, 
why is why is this happening what have we done what's the what's the real reason for it and there's a question well is it because human beings have become one dimensional well essentially i think it is commercialization and commodification they are the watchwords of our modern culture and um, going back to the 1880s uh, langstroth in the us was the first person to develop the commercial hive and in a certain sense it's been downhill all the way since then as soon as we start to as soon as we start to treat the honeybee as a commodity as something to be to be exploited then i think we we should we should expect uh, problems it's interesting in this country you know we a uh, hundred years as government report in 2008 a hundred years ago there were around one million beehives in this country and in 1950s this had reduced to 400,000 and in 2008 there were there were 274,000 bees so it looks like the honeybee is has become a kind of one dimensional commodity something to be exploited and understood purely for the benefits that it can give man. But the honeybee has not always been seen as a commodity. And I want to refer to the work of Rudolf Steiner here, who in 1923, in his nine lectures on bees, said the following. And I, and I want to use this thought as a kind of as a key thought for us to carry through the remainder of what I'm going to say, which I hope you will see includes a great deal of science. But I want to speak from the, I want to, I want to refer to the work of a man here who, who created something called spiritual science. It was looking into the meaning of things using more than just your physical senses. And he said of the honeybee, whoever looks at a beehive, should actually say with an exalted mind, making this detour by way of the beehive, the entire cosmos can find its way into human beings and help to make them sound in mind and body. That's quite something to say. I'm gonna park that for a second. It's a lot to take in, but Rudolf Steiner also spoke about human beings having kind of threefold uh, nature to them. And to me, when I, when, I, uh, when I read about this, it seemed pretty obvious because, you know, when you look at how we operate, we do truly think one thing, we might feel another and do something completely different. So we're kind of a, you know, we have the capacity to think and uh, and we have the capacity to feel but we also have the instinct to act we have something which can tell us that this is what we must do uh, either through our intuition or through our instincts and we also have the tools that go with these these three realms so in thinking we have our imagination that which collects and understands our experience in feeling we have our inspiration we have something where we we take on board that which means something in a completely different realm in the realm of our emotions and our experience uh, our feelings and in our acting or our willing then we have our intuition intuition or perhaps sometimes we might think of it as instincts but intuition is that that way of uh, understanding a situation which gives us a, almost a direct kind of understanding of of what we either what we're looking at or how we believe we should act 
And here's where I want to talk about um, the work of, of uh, a man called uh, Horst Kornberger, who has written a book called The Global Hive. And I think he's kind of putting his finger on it here. And he, he, I don't know whether he coined the term, but he uses the term compassionate ecology. And he's talking about these, these three different functions that we have as human beings. And he says, the difference between thoughts and feelings is that our thoughts keep us detached while our feelings make us related. And he goes on to say, the B crisis shows how detachment can become destructive and that a new approach is needed, one that is related as well as objective. Horst Kornberger also argues that, say, the loss of pollinating hives for, for biodiversity is not only an example of, of a loss of biodiversity, but it's an issue which we should be addressing not just in a scientific manner, but also acknowledges the way we perceive and think, the way we feel, and also the way we act. As he says, it's hard to have an emotional relationship with a chemical formula, and there's nothing sacred about a genome. When all regard is lost, nature becomes a commodity. The beehive becomes a factory and the bee queen a genetic machine, which is exactly what she has become. Artificial insemination, the prevention of swarming, the housing of bees in situations which they're not um, used to, the carting of bees thousands of miles. The list is, the list is endless. That the bees in a way have survived and, and uh, for, for so long in a relatively healthy condition is, is a miracle in itself. But this is not how man has always seen the honeybee. And I want to focus here a little bit on, on how the honeybee has been seen in the past. And so let's start in India. The Hindu gods were always associated with honeybees. The gods Vishnu, Krishnu and Indra were called Madhava, the nectar-born ones. And their symbol was the symbol of the bee. And Vishnu is presented as a blue bee upon a lotus flower, the symbol of life, resurrection and nature. Well, let's move to the Egyptians. How did they see uh, the honeybee? Well, Neith was worshipped throughout Egypt, but was particularly associated with the western delta town of Sias, where the temple to Neith became known as the house of the bee. But it was in Ephesus that at the temple of Ephesus in Greek times, where the priestesses were called Melissa or bees, as a symbol of, of higher knowledge, as the symbol of the search for higher knowledge. And the, the priests were called Essene or king bees. I think most of you will know that in the Quran, for example, that the honeybee is seen as something very special. And uh, in, in verses 68 to 69, in the Quran, it said, the Lord revealed to the bee, make your honeycomb in the mountains and in the trees and in the hives, which men build and eat all the flowers and fruits and do in the way of thy Lord submissively. There comes from their bellies a liquid of many hues in which there is a healing for men. Therein is surely a sign of men who reflect. It was believed 
that potentially having its origins in Babylonian times, that in Afghanistan there was a secret work school, a monastery called the Samoan Dark. And the Samoan Dark means the beehive or the collectors of honey. And the purpose of the beehive was to collect human knowledge, which during times when knowledge was dissipating, they would store it up for the future when it could be used again. And most often this would happen in times of difficulty on earth when, when, when the earth was in times of turmoil. Well, if there was a time when the earth is in difficulties, I think this is probably it. But this man, Rudolf Steiner, I come back again uh, at the end of this little section. And here he is again said, when you consider that bees are influenced most of all by cosmic forces, then you'll also see that bees provide a detour for man to take into their beings what is right and necessary. I'm going to explore these, these very big ideas uh, a, a little more, but I think we can see that the bee has been seen in one way for thousands, millennia, but that now the bee, the honeybee has moved from the position of the God to that primarily of the commodity. It's gone from a multi-dimensional -dimension, position to a, a very singular position, a position of something to be exploited. Whereas real medicine, real health, uh, can only exist, according to Steiner, when it penetrates into a knowledge which embraces the human being in respect of three things, the three things that we've been talking about, that man is composed of, the three realms, body, soul, and spirit. So one of the, one of the things that I've been working on mostly recently is, that, is a desire to build what I call the bee arc. And I'm going to tell you more about that practical project uh, later on. But First of all, why call it the B arc? This is not the B arc, A R K. This is not Noah's ark. It's it's the B arc with a the B arc as a bridge, because it seems to me, and I'll be explaining about it as we go along. It seems to me that the 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 honeybee is offering us an example. It's telling us certain things through its being and through its history and through its meaning, that I think can help us in the times which we face currently. And it's interesting that the, the catastrophic problems that honeybees have faced have all been primarily economic. They've been very one dimensional, but in understanding the economic problems that, the, that we, we have, have brought about by the way we've treated the bees, I think we've, what's emerged is a, is a newer and broader understanding of what the human being is and nobody will have uh, not being aware of the many different charities and projects and and campaigns that are related to to working with with the honeybee this is the this is an outline of the of the the uh, the bee arc which will be on two floors i say i'm going to be talking to you a bit more about it later on but you can see there are three, there are three um, uh, basic sort of units, and we will be looking at the at the three qualities of the of the honeybee, the three ways in which the honeybee can inspire, uh, inspire our um, our lives, and um, in in a cultural and spiritual way, in a social and community way and also in an economic and environmental way. What we intend to do is 
is create three elements to this, to the BR. One will be uh, an international discovery center, which will explore the social and the economic and cultural meaning of Nani B. The second will be an international research center. And this will be basically a college of future living. This will, will explore how human beings through the inspiration of the honeybee can look to ways in which they can work together again, the way they can live together and the way they can come to understand and learn and grow together, uh, how they can understand the world together in a better way. And thirdly, there will be a very practical model of small scale sustainable community, exploring how we live together and, and how we work together through practical workshops, making useful things and, uh, and living a, a, a different and more sustainable economic life. But I want to tell you how I got to the BIARC. I think it's important, but we're, we're all on a journey, it seems to me. And, and my journey, I guess, began in earnest in 1968 as a as a revolutionary student and the, the picture in the in the right hand corner was the very prim and proper James in 1968 freshly graduated as a, a, a um, from from law school in London but there was a lot of exciting things to do I was studying uh, African law uh, at the School of Oriental African Studies at the time of the Vietnam War and uh, whilst I, whilst I, I'm, I don't think I'm actually in this picture. Certainly, I was, I was there somewhere. That that experience, that experience, was a, a seminal one for me because it was a time, in a way, not unlike our times today. Uh, it was a time of tremendous change, where I, new ideas were, were, were blossoming everywhere new ideas about economics about education about spiritual life in in all the realms of our life uh, the the ideas were blossoming particularly in the student community uh, that process led to the abandonment of my my career as a as a, as a barrister and a lecturer in in law and uh, and a move to the country where by some extraordinary uh, miracle, basically in search of work, I ended up become a potter, becoming a potter. And whilst, uh, whilst well, in, between, in between making pot, pots, managed to, managed to have uh, um, six children. Not all of them uh, have born during this phase of my life, but you can see three of my beaut beautiful children there uh, in 1975. It, it seemed to me that, you know, if you're going to live this new life and we were living the self-sufficiency, we were living, we were living the dream uh, in, uh, in the 1970s in East Anglia. And uh, we started something called the Midwave New Smallholders and Friends. We were bringing people together who were living in a different way, whether they were smallholders or accountants or car mechanics or potters, weavers, uh, or, or, or whatever. It was, they, they, people came together and we had markets and Kayleys and goodness knows what, but it was a way of bringing people together to, to explore uh, a different way of living. Eventually we, we moved to Whitby and we set up the mustard seed and the mustard seed, uh, it was a health food shop, but you may know the, you may know the, uh, the, the reference in the Bible where it says that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can come and nest in its branches. And in a way, that was the spirit of what we wanted to do. We wanted to create something. We wanted a door to be available through which people could come in and explore some of the things that we felt were very important in, in our life new forms of education, uh, new forms of economics and new forms of spiritual life. And we started the Common Box, which was, which was a mutual help among small friendly businesses 
it had about 100 businesses in it. But in 1990, I started a business with uh, another beekeeper and uh, to, to explore this incredible product around which I spent 30 years of my life called Propolis. I did lots of research and uh, tried to sort of get to the bottom of, of this incredible product. It's antibiotic, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antifungal. And, uh, and uh, we did very little for, for many years in terms of selling this product. But then a journalist that we got to know wrote a full page piece in the Sun newspaper. And in year two of our, of our small business, we went from a matter of tens of thousands of pounds to a turnover of 1.5 million. It was an, it's an incredible story, which I'd love to tell you sometime, <laughs> but it, was too, it would take too long. So, but, but what is propolis? Propolis is basically, it's a substance that the bees collect from trees and plants. It's resin that like sticky buds in the springtime, they collect it and they use it to defend the hive against, against infection. And uh, Aristotle coined the word, it, 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 it comes from the Greek pro before polis, the city. In, in truth, propolis is the defender of the city. Not only did he defend the city physically by using it as a building material or use it to, to create the labyrinthine entrance to the beehive, but they use it, they render it down and they use it to effectively disinfect the hive and create the autoimmune system for the bee colony. There are, there are 60 to 70,000 bees in an average colony. They're like, they're a super organism, but they have no skin that contains them. And it's propolis that keeps the beehive um, free from infection. It's a most remarkable substance. Um, it's where, where, where within the beehive in conditions which are absolutely perfect for the growing of bacteria, the bacteria do not, do not grow. A really good example of how that works is that if, if something larger than the bees can, can get rid of physically invades the hive, like a mouse or something, uh, uh, if it gets in, the bees can sting it, but they can't move it. So what do they do? They, they, um, they cover what would become a serious risk, a serious bacterial risk to the hive. They cover it in propolis. And you can see here a mouse and you could go back, they'll cover it in wax uh, after covering it in, in propolis. And you could go back to that mouse and um, 20 years later and find it completely mummified. In fact, mummification of the pharaohs relied on propolis and honey to, to preserve the, uh, the pharaohs. So, I've just said the Egyptians used it, they used it for embalming. The Greeks used it as a medicine. The Egyptians also used it as, as a medicine, medicine being administered by the, the priestly caste. You'll remember our references back to the, to the Egyptians uh, use of the symbolism of, the, of the, the honeybee there. Hippocrates, the founder of modern medicine, is reputed to have used propolis to cure wounds and ulcers, both external and internal. The ancient Hebrew had a word sori for propolis and they used it for a number of therapeutic uses. The Romans used it and it was very good for the ripening indurations and the laying of pains of the sinews and cytorizing ulcers of the most obstinate nature. Propolis was used all over the world by the Arabs, used in the Middle Ages. And for many years at the beginning of our kind of scientific era, it was researched a tremendous amount in Eastern Europe. And uh, I always quote this bit of research uh, from the Kazan Veterinary College in 1975. I quote it because it's research that we're now replicating at the University of Leeds in um, in, in, in Yorkshire. 
And, but in 1975, the combining of propolis with antibiotics increased the effectiveness of the antibiotic by between 10 and 100 times. This was done at the Kazan Veterinary uh, College in 1975. Uh, we have just replicated some of this work in 2021 at Leeds Beckett University and have found some incredible results uh, which could lead to, the, to, the, to, to, to our ability to use uh, antibiotics again that have become totally resistant to bacteria but with the addition of propolis uh, can both regain the, 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 the uh, activity against bacteria but also act to soften the, the negative impact of, of antibiotics, which as you know, are rather like smart missiles. They're supposed to kill just the bad guys, but they end up killing a lot of the good guys as well. So, you know, for, for many years now, we've been, we've been researching, we've spent, we've spent uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds, and we've made some very interesting discoveries. The, the first one is that wherever you find propolis, the climate affects it. So what's happening is that the bee, the bee is collecting the, the bee is collecting the its local environment. It's collecting what the plants need to survive, the resins. They're taking it back to the hive. It's modifying that in the hive and transforming that into a substance which it enables itself to. Um, uh, which enables itself to uh, protect its, its environment. And uh, the story of Bacchus draconiculifolia, I think, uh, illustrates how, how what the bee is doing in, in very specific environments. So Bacchus draconiculifolia is, is a, a rosemary type uh, uh, plant and it, it grew really well in the polluted environment of Minas Gerais in Brazil. Minas Gerais, which as the name suggests, was, was an area decimated by mining for minerals. The, the, the environment was polluted, but this plant, Bacchus draconiculifolia, thrived on it and managed to overcome the kind of cancerous environment created by the polluted environment. What this, what this meant that it produced these um, it produced these resin glands, and you can see on the right hand side um, a, a Brazilian bee biting down into the into the uh, buds of this plant and sucking the resin, which is going to form the basis of the of the, um, the of the propolis for for that beehive. And effectively, what the what they found, for instance, when the modern researchers did this, they found that this, this propolis was highly cytotoxic and has, has subsequently come to be used as a, as a food supplement, but basically to help treat cancer. Because of course, uh, it, it's, it's, you need to be able to kill those, those, um, those, those uh, cancer, cancer cells. So, what the what the beehive is doing, effectively, it's taking the it's taking the plant's immune system, and it's converting it into its its own immune system. But the thing is, your immune system requires different things in in different places. So, so, so in the subtropical zone, this is another discovery we've made. With, in a subtropical zone, that the the chemical components of propolis contain far more. Um, phenolic compounds, uh, which are more uh, antibacterial, where in temperate zones they contain more flavonoid compounds and these are more antioxidants, so they're better as anti-inflammatories. So this, this, is, um, this is our kind of, this is the, the, these are the key kind of, key kind of, um, uh, um, this, is a, this is the key kind of finding that we've got from our from, from something like 20 years of, of research. Um, why does it work in man? Well, 
um, essentially, I think because in a way the organism, the superorganism, which is the is the honeybee, is very very close to in a way to our to the human the human organism uh, in ways that I don't think we quite yet understand. But one of the key features that I think is a clue to that is that the temperature inside the honeybee is very close to ours. It's about 35 degrees, whereas in 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 our body, as I'm sure everybody has found out over the uh, over the of the COVID crisis that, that our temperature is 36, 37 degrees. So it's very close indeed. We discovered another amazing thing, and that is in an area, we collected propolis from all over the world, in an area where there was sleeping sickness. We found, um, we found some propolis that when we analyzed it contained an anti-trypanosome chemical, i.e. a chemical which showed that this, that the, uh, showed that the propolis, so to speak, was defending the hive against, was against, uh, against the, the trypanosomiasis, the sleeping sickness. This is a very, very exciting, uh, this is a very, very exciting discovery because in a certain sense, I think you might be getting the message that, that propolis from specific areas is, 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 is a combination, is almost like the fingerprint of the environment's health challenges, which the bee collects from various plants, the resins from various plants. It takes it back to the hive and it uses it to create its, um, uh, uh, its immune defense mechanism. If, as we believe, that the immune defense mechanism for the honeybee is is very close to being able to support ours then then what we have is the is the concept of um, geographic medicine you know so there could be there could we could be collecting medicines that have specific functions potentially against um, um, you know pot potentially medicines that are more antibiotic medicines that are more anti-inflammatory or antioxidants, or perhaps even medicines that have specific functions like in our ability to treat the, 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 the dynamics of, uh, of say, say, sleeping sickness. This triggered a, this triggered a, a, um, a, uh, a research um, program. We went to three African, uh, we went to five Af African countries to look at uh, three diseases, all, all which, um, where the vector was the was the fly, and we were inspired by this uh, sleeping sickness research, and that's 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 uh, research that's still going on. But I think we discovered something more when we looked at at, at beekeeping African cultures. We we discovered that beekeeping, so to speak, supported had another three dimensional aspect to it. It supported the physical health and well being of people, although not as much as we'd expected, but, but propolis was there, for instance, as, as, uh, as a medicine, but of course so was honey, and so was beer making from honey. Uh, it, it, it supported the economic and environmental health of the beekeepers, and increasingly uh, women's uh, beekeeping cooperatives uh, have sprung up in areas of uh, East and West Africa. And it kind of supported the social and community health of people because perhaps through the beer making, I don't know, but, but also by bringing people together to work together and to, and to create sort of economic advantage in local communities. So uh, another aspect of, uh, of that threefoldness, but the Epizodical Research Center focused on, on uh, bringing together scientists from all over the world to look at what, uh, the, what propolis, and that community has grown consistently. Here's a, the second uh, international conference we had in, in Bulgaria, and then uh, we have plans for a third international conference in 2020, which of course was, was postponed for the reasons you'll all be familiar, but we are planning uh, uh, an, an international online conference and we've brought together a number of international uh, organizations concerned with 
the medicinal properties of bee products. And we're running a number of conferences um, under the banner of the Global Bee Medicine Group. Um, and particularly our own group, the International Propolis Research Group, which was started in, in, in 2016 and will be uh, running a major conference uh, on the online platform. And one of the things we will be hearing from is work that's been done on Brazil. Interestingly, that work was done with the, 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 the work about cancer, but in, in this instance, and, and it's not the only research that's been doing, been done about uh, COVID. In this instance, we'll be hearing about some very exciting work done uh, combining propolis and uh, traditional treatments for, uh, uh, for viruses um, and for COVID. Very successful shortening hospital stays and overall supporting the immune system of the, of the patients there. We've known for years that propolis is not only antibacterial, but it's antiviral, antifungal. Uh, but what it, what it is primarily is not is not an anti, it's a pro, it's a for thing. It's something which boosts your whole body to be antibacterial, antiviral, and so on. So it is truly a kind of, it is truly a kind of threefold, um, a threefold, a multi-dimensional medicine. Now, I want to, as briefly as I can, to, to explore with you the, the, my own personal research, uh, which, uh, where I've tried to kind of, tried to kind of understand uh, the, the, the mystery of of colony collapse disorder. Of course, there are many, many components to it in terms of the way we've treated the bees and some of them I expressed earlier on. But I wanted, I came across this, I came, came across some research um, which had been published in Discovery Magazine, but it was a mathematician called uh, Barbara Shipman. She, she, um, she was, um, she'd studied mathematics uh, Harvard and she was looking at something called uh, at multi-dimensional flag structures and she found that she found that if you could cast a shadow on these multi-dimensional structures which obviously are very difficult to see because they're multi-dimensional and turn them into a two-dimensional um, hexagon they formed curves that reminded her of the bees recruitment dance. They reminded her of the, the waggle dance. And, and, and the more she explored this, explored this manifold uh, flag structure, the more she found that these curves precisely matched the ones in the recru recruitment dance. And, and over and over, she found that the curves were nothing special in themselves, but that the dance patterns kept on emerging. This is the image of the waggle dance for honeybees. She she went on to she went on to theorize that 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 because the honeybees the honeybees themselves have very small brains, how do they come to how do they come to manage these uh, the, the, these complex the complex systems which govern this incredibly mm, sophisticated superorganism. Where does that, where do the messages come from? Um, and the Waggle Dance, she felt was a very important, uh, and beekeepers also think this too, but it was a very important way of transferring this message. This, this sort of figure of eight, this, this, this kind of messaging device, uh, and the figure of eight kind of changes its shape depending on where the source of the food is or where the bees want to swarm and so on. But obviously this figure of eight, and Barbara Shipman was imagining that um, this figure of eight somehow existed in the non-physical, the non-physical world or in a very fine physical world uh, and what existed outside the honeybees but so to speak, transferred itself into the physical action of the honeybee. The, the figure of eight and the, and the lemniscate we've we've known for we've known for, for 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 thousands of years is the symbol for for infinity. 
I decided I was going to do a bit of really serious research by uh, <clears throat> taking to Google and and following a following a simple thought. If this is if this figure of eight concept of of a kind of uh, almost a universal um, cybernetic for creation and for messaging, then it would be there probably in migration. Migration is something that's always fascinated me. And so uh, turning to the turning to the greatest research tool in, in the world uh, now, Google, I found the New Zealand um, uh, shearwater, the sooty shearwater. And yeah, they migrated, but they didn't migrate in straight lines. They migrated in a physical, a, a figure of eight and they do it in the do they do they have two routes and both those routes are in in a figure of eight i looked at all sorts of things i found that dolphins for instance when when they went to sleep dolphins go to go to sleep and return and swim in a figure of eight pattern you think they might also also um uh, animals in animals in zoos that have become disoriented revert to a pattern called stereotypical behavior and they end up walking around in the figure of eight. But this was the most ex most interesting for me and that is um, something I'd never heard of called an analemma. Now an analemma is, is it basically refers to the way light hits the earth. Because the earth is not rotating in a symmetric way, the, the light from the earth is effectively tracing a figure of eight onto the onto the earth. Uh, uh, I don't know whether this really this really fascinated me because here we've got this we've got we've got light so to speak landing on the earth, albeit over long periods of time, but landing on the earth so to speak in in a figure of eight, rather in the same way as if you were if you were holding your your golden syrup on your porridge and and dribbling it on your on the on the on the porridge how, how you might you might draw your name or draw a figure of eight somehow somehow the light is sort of uh, is descending into the earth in this continuous stream of figure of eight and then as the mind does it it uh, it went on to the to 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 realize that um, dna of course is a, is a is a continuous double figure of eight and, and I read a really interesting book by, by a guy called Jeremy Narby talking about the way in which the shamans perceive um, uh, spiritual forces in, uh, when, the, uh, when they've taken Ayasku. And, and Jeremy Narby is, uh, has, has, an anthropologist, has worked out how the shapes which the shamans claim to see are, that are in fact uh, descriptions of DNA fundamentally, um, but I guess this is where <laughs> this is where it brings me to the, the 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 title, and that is the the human heart, because because our blood circulation also takes that form of the of the figure of eight. Um, now I'm going to come back to that this this three-dimensional force. You remember we talked about those thinking, feeling, and willing. And um, so I just kind of supposed, uh, superimposed that, that, that figure of eight onto these three forms. And in a way, you know, if you looked at the, that if you looked at the, at the, the, the heart, the heart's in the middle of that figure of eight, isn't it? Uh, and in a way, the heart is also the center of our feeling. It is the center of our social being. It's the center of how we perceive who we are in relationship uh, to others. And, um, you know, it struck me that in a way, the, the other two realms of this sort of figure of eight were our thinking at one end and also our acting, our willing, our instincts at, at, at another end. But it's also it's also true that in a sense our our, our social order is th is three dimensional. You know, um, often the the three legged stool 
is quoted because the three leg stool is is when the legs are all the same length it's a very stable thing and you know if you imagine one leg as the you know, the, the economic realm and one leg as the as the social and community realm and another leg as the as the cultural and spiritual realm so here we have a model of something that is balanced and stable and a healthy society as well as a healthy human being as well as uh, as well as the uh, as well as real a true medicine as well as the beehive as well as is involves a balance as balance between you know the, uh, the, the social realm and the economic realm and the and the cultural realm the reality though is that we're unhealthy in all of these three realms um maybe like the honeybee it's community collapse disorder that we've got certainly our immune systems are under massive pressure just in the same as the same way as the immune system of the honeybee is and which is is failing and uh so the you know it it feels like you know if our immune system actually is composed out of a mysterious thing which we don't really understand from a purely scientific point of view but for example if you have a serious shock if you're stressed your immune system plummets so your immune system is related to other factors and i'm gonna i'm gonna take the plunge and say it is related not just to your physical life but to your feeling life and to your and to your willing life and to your and to your cultural and your spiritual life that it actually is related to all three and all three need to be and so yeah 60 percent of people uh you know in, in 2012 in in certain western countries live alone you know social life is is has has compared with 1920 is gone uh yeah i can make our economic and our environment life i don't need to really i don't really need to say anything more about that uh and and our our culture and spiritual life is at, at, a, at a, 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 a profoundly low ebb, a, a sense of, you know, we, a sense of we beginning to ask the question, particularly with COVID, well, who are we? <laughs> and, and, and what does our life, what does life, our life mean? And, and how are we coping, uh, coping with what was an epidemic before COVID, COVID that is the, the, the epidemic of, of loneliness well i've been trying to tackle this in a really practical way and and uh, 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 a couple of years ago i created something called threes company what i was looking to do is to sort of look at ways in which you can explore how we build healthier organizations i've been involved with healthy businesses uh, healthy healthy people and healthy medicine three-dimensional medicine and propolis and medicine from the the honeybee what about healthy organizations um how can we apply this same thinking to them and i've got three organizations in my world uh, i've got a, i've got a business that uh i've got nature's laboratory which produces bee medicines it produces uh, medicinal herbs and it, and it produces natural skin care and it's a business that is primarily focused so it's called a business primarily focused on its economic role but but it my view is that it can't really develop in a truly healthy way unless it also stands in that stable relationship with its cultural and social life and for many for many businesses the only way they can survive is by by adopting strategies which cut against those uh, uh, those those principles uh, the dispensary which has been going for about 12 years is basically a, 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 has a social focus it's a it's a health food shop but we put on events and and concerts and uh, workshops and so on and we try and explore you know what horse kornberg talked about a relatedness 
how do we make things relatedness? Science can give us an objective view, so-called. Heisenberg said, there's no such thing as objectivity. The observer changes the observation. It interacts with, we are, we, everything we do, you know, we bring our relatedness, but we have to, we have to imagine it and we have to, we have to value it. Now, the cultural project is the project I'm finishing on now, the BIARC, because uh, it, it, it's a project which aims to, in a way, spell out uh, the, uh, spell out this kind of threefoldness in a, in a grand, in a grand way, but in a way which I think is perhaps becoming increasingly obvious. I've already told you we want to set up three three elements to it. There's a discovery center, there's a research center, there's the small scale uh, sustainable uh, community. And uh, here are these, the, the, the three elements of the of the of the visitor center the, the visitor would go on a journey from the cultural and spiritual meaning of the honeybee through to the social and community meaning of the honeybee and into the economic and environmental meaning of the honeybee and also what those areas mean for human beings and what we can learn from it but underneath there we have also we have three more uh, units which will be a research unit a college of future living where we can explore how we understand and develop our, our cultural life, our culture and artistic and our spiritual life, how we develop and understand our social and economic life, uh, social and community life, and how we can develop and understand and integrate our economic and environmental life with all three. Just as Horst Kornberger was saying, we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to feel and we need to perceive as well as we need to think and imagine. We need to imagine, we need to, we need to be inspired and we need to be intuitive if we can. We must learn how to acquire these new skills because if we don't, we're in a dead end. Um, uh, and here's the, here's the living area because it'll be a place where people live and where where people will also work and is a, an a elevation of the building and a, a just a general picture of what the 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 building would look look like from outside you know obviously we want to make it a zero carbon uh we want to make it a pure illustration of 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 both uh environmental um principles but in fact what we're doing we're imitating the beehive and we want to make it an international model of how we, as human beings, can explore not just the one dimensional <laughs> component of our lives and of the honeybee's life, but of three dimensions of the social and political, of the cultural and spiritual, and of the economic and uh, environmental. And I'm going to come back again without apologies to finishing by speaking about what uh, Rudolf Steiner said about um, about the beehive, and it, in a way, it's become the it's become the watchword of the bee arc, the strap line for which is the nature of the future. And he says, whoever looks at a beehive should actually say, with an exalted frame of mind, making this detour. By way of the beehive, the entire cosmos can find its way into human beings and help to make them sound in mind and body. And finally, uh, I'm going to end on something I wrote uh, some time ago for, for a celebration, but in a way it's become, it's become uh, a hymn to the honeybee and a hymn for the bee ark. And I'd like to finish by reading it to you. How we have misunderstood you, Melissa, messenger of the light, the honeybee, companion of the Logos, the one remaining one, always a nursemaid to the human being, the detour around our divisions back to oneness. 
Never have you doubted us, though we have doubted you. Throughout the whole of time, you were present in your priestly crown, present as a stepping stone for man in Babylon, in ancient India, in Egypt, in the summer when dark, in Greece at Ephesus, with Artemis the guide and Melissa and the Essene, your priestess and your priest. Come back this day into our true imagination no longer just metaphor for sweetness, but as companion to our metamorphosis. Have patience with our prayer, as once more we honour you, asking your consent to be an ark which can guide us from these darkened times to a braver start, to a new awakening of the human heart. Thank you for listening and thank you to the honeybee. Roiso i Erogoid, welcome to Erogoid. Our home and the home of trees and bees, our small beekeeping business, nestled in the Merionith oak forests of southern Snowdonia. Hello, we're Paul and Pauline Aslin and we are Trees and Bees. This is our small holding and Trees and Bees is our business which is beekeeping and beeswax products, which we're going to tell you a bit more about. Our small holding is in Snowdonia, between the Malvac Estuary and Cather Idris, near Dolgethai. We keep ducks, chickens and sometimes pigs. We grow vegetables and fruit in our garden, orchard and polytunnel. And we're surrounded by native Merionith oak woodland. But our main focus is on the bees. We have 40 colonies of honeybees in six apiaries along the estuary. We produce honey and beeswax products which we sell at markets, shows, via a few retail outlets and through our website. Right, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how we open a hive and how we look at it. We also provide beekeeping courses and mentoring to help people get started in beekeeping. But why do we call ourselves trees and bees? The bees bit is obvious, but trees are important too. Woodland is the natural habitat of honeybees. Not only do they rely on mature trees to provide suitable cavities in which to build their intricate wax nests, but trees also provide a large proportion of the bee's diet of nectar and pollen. This is our home apiary. We have uh, five or six other apiaries along the estuary. We have a wide range of forage here. Later in the season the bees will love this bramble. In May, those two huge sycamore trees will be absolutely humming, but today it's the willow that's just, just in flower today for the first time. So the bees will be starting to collect the pollen. It's a bit early to ne for nectar, but there's pollen on this willow now. Pollen is the protein food the bees feed to their larvae to help them grow whereas nectar is the energy food to keep all the bees going throughout their life and which they convert into honey to see the colony through the winter. When we think of flowers, most people think of wildflower meadows, hedgerows and clover and orchards, all of which are wonderful, but much less common than they used to be in this country. 
In fact, many trees produce large quantities of flower which we often don't notice in their canopies. Bees collect early pollen from hazel and willow. Some of the first nectar of the season comes from blackthorn, wild cherry and holly. We get major nectar flows from sycamore, hawthorn, chestnut and lime trees in the right weather. And some of the most prodigious nectar plants are bramble and late in the season ivy, both of which thrive in woodland. So bees need trees and trees need bees and we need them both. Honey is wonderful stuff, but beeswax is even more valuable. It's valuable to the bees. They need to use eight times as much nectar to produce wax as they do to produce the same weight of honey. And it's valuable to us. Our beekeeping enterprise has become a viable and sustainable business because rather than just relying on honey, we utilise the beeswax to make a range of natural products. Soaps and skin creams. Polish. As a polish, beeswax nourishes, protects and enhances wood or leather. And candles. Beeswax candles are slow burning, air clarifying and pleasant smelling. You can't get better. Beeswax has been a nourishing and protective natural ingredient in skincare products for centuries. It softens and hydrates skin, helping to heal cracked skin and form a protective barrier. It's antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal and anti-inflammatory. We use simple recipes to produce our skin creams, balm and soaps in small batches in our home workshop. This is our honey and wax workshop. And Pauline's making candles at the moment. And it smells glorious because beeswax is gorgeous. So these are candles in tins. These little ones are the emergency candles. We also do um, survival candles with three wicks which are very slow burning because beeswax is slow burning and the emergency candle which is a bit smaller and then little tea lights and the tea lights will burn for a couple of hours easily. So I've laid a few of the products out here in the sunshine because it's easier to film than in a dark room. Obviously we have honeys, clear honey, set honey and this is last year's heather honey. Polish and wax skin creams, moisturisers, balms and heavy duty hand and foot cream. Soaps and candles. This is just a small selection, a pillar, some novelty candles and a pair of dipped dinner candles and the candles in tins which we've already seen. So please have a look at our website, try some beeswax products, you'll never use a petroleum based lip balm again and perhaps even come and visit. We have two self-catering holiday cottages on our small holding. Details are on our website www.treesandbees.co.uk Welcome back everybody and we hope you've enjoyed our Trees and Bees conference today. The speakers have been amazing, the projects have been amazing. We hope we've raised awareness of various different trees and bees pro uh, projects including you know um, honey bees, wild bees, burrowing bees and also the various different elements of tree planting and natural regeneration and we hope we've inspired you to look at trees and bees in a slightly different way but also inspire you to go out and take action. So today's conference is all about celebrating the United Nations International Day of Forests and their theme for this year is restoring forests for well-being. So let's all think about you know how we can use the, the trees and bees, how we can inspire change and action for trees and bees and also enjoy the natural environment and protect it for future generations. So we'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today, to everyone for joining us today and in particular our Trees and Bees speakers and also our project showcases and of course our project partners Wildcraft. So please do, if you take anything away from this conference, just take action for bees, take action for trees and be more trees. Thank you everybody, stay safe.